Oh, this is my phone, but I like a larger screen. <laughs> well, no. yeah. glad you're here, one way or another. All right, that's true. No, if it wasn't for glitches, there wouldn't be technology. Is that your television, Daniel? No, that wasn't me. I don't somebody's, know who that was. Somebody's got something going there. But it's a good question. It usually is. Me. Everybody else is muted, so it must be you or me. I muted the offender. <laughs> <laughs> I never. Good morning, Steve. Boker toe. Boker mediocre. Mm -hmm. Do you know if Beth Yashurin is going to require masks if you go to services once the mandate is lifted? Well, we, we still yes, we do. Are. Um, hopefully, we're, we're getting to a time where you know, things will ease up. But at this time, yeah, we are asking that everybody wear masks. That's good. Yeah. Uh, but we've loosened up in terms of numbers and uh, we, you know, we encourage those who are comfortable doing so to, uh, you know, feel free to register to come to services in-house. I went to services yesterday. Of course, I go to services every Shabbat, but, you know, <laughs> what else is new? How many people think are what, Marcia? How many people were there? I'm well, sorry. let's see. In the sanctuary, there were probably about 40. In the museum minion, I would guess at least 30, maybe there were 30. Five. And in um, chapel service, probably about 25. Oh, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people in museum minion, which has not been having in-house services because of uh, Dan Musher's second bar mitzvah, which was very nice. Oh, I see, yeah. Yeah. yeah All right, learning. hello everybody. Ronnie and Jerry, you're there. Karen, hello. Hi, Rabbi, how are you? Hanging in there. Were you at the bar mitzvah yesterday? For I dinner? was. Nice. I was. Um, it sounded know. like quite a crowd. I know Toby was there. Yeah, wild bunch. Yeah. <laughs> no, but, every, uh, everybody being compliant? Uh, <laughs> I didn't check, but I think so. You know, I, pretty, pretty tough crowd at Beth Yashurn, but, um, but I think uh, everybody was with, you know, within the limits. Mm -hmm. So, um, I want to pick up where we left off, and this was uh, just in the um, the last text that we were looking at. Oh, wait a second. Hold on. I I need to. Um, Pull that up. And let's try this again. Yeah. Yeah, so this was um, the, uh, the end of the third text in Unit 7. Uh, and you'll notice the kind of backhanded slap at Maimonides here. Right, you know, today, you know, most of us, if we think of Maimonides, we think, wow, greatest Jewish mind in the last thousand years or so. Um, not everybody 
was, I mean, everybody respected Maimonides' intellect, but not everybody liked what he was saying. So look again at this piece where Alcaraz says, I admit that the guide is not all of one piece. In other words, it's not all bad. Some of it is pleasant and some of it is destructive. I mean, it's like saying, okay, this part is nice and this part is radioactive, right? Attracted by the good parts, one is seduced by its bad. Would that this book had never come into being, never been translated and never read. Come on, tell us how you really feel about my monies, right? Yeah, the hand of Samuel Ibn Tibbon, the translator into, uh, you, know, um, you know, the guide was written in um, uh, Aramaic, Ibn Tibbon put it into Hebrew. He's the first in the tree, he didn't know how destructive it would be, he began to be a stumbling block for the people of your country. He gave them the guide as an act of righteousness, but it turned out to be an, to produce an outcry. So notice the little pun there between tzedakah, righteousness, and tzaka, an outcry, you know, something outrageous, something terrible. I like that one. Yeah, isn't isn't that um, isn't that kind of special? Yeah, so um, so this is um, you know some of the reaction in the in the centuries immediately following the publication of Guide to the Perplexed. So uh, let me stop here, and um, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to put them up here. Yes, Ronnie. Uh, you have to unmute, Ronnie. Okay. The printing press was not invented until after Maimonides. This is, I'm just curious. Correct. How was the book reproduced? And my second part, I would imagine back then that a fairly large percentage of the population, even the Jewish population, was illiterate. So who are we talking about that's reading this book so first of all, uh, as far as printing was concerned, the book was distributed the same way any book was distributed. It was handwritten manuscripts. Wow. Right? Um, but, you know, that the same thing was true of the Bible. The same thing was true of Rashi's commentaries, um, all the great books. You know, and, and the Zohar also... Um, although it, it didn't really become popular until uh, after the printing press was invented, um, there were a tremendous number of manuscripts of it that circulated. But you had so, to be, oh, a yes, person so of the a certain amount was, of wealth. was true for the guide for the perplexed. Okay, but you had to be... You, know, you had to have the monetary funds in order to buy a manuscript. This was Correct. not. This Correct. was not widely distributed. Um, I I don't know exactly how widely it was, but it was apparently widely enough to provoke opposition. You know when you know if if people hadn't been purchasing or circulating it, then. Um, Nobody would have complained about it. Nobody yes. would have known about it. Because I would think the general populace would not have access to his work. So, so one, the cost, and second, because they were probably illiterate. Well, okay. So as far as literacy was concerned, uh, at least among males, literacy uh, among the Jews was extremely high. Oh, that's good to hear. Yeah. So, well, you know, uh, funny thing about that, the Jews insisted that at least the men should be able to read uh, because, you know, you had to learn to read the Torah. You had to learn the Sidur, right? 
and um, you know, some people learned those things by heart uh, if they couldn't, you know, afford to get a manuscript of it. But but many people they just they read them. Thank you, Karen. Would you say today when people think about Maimonides that they think about him as being um, a controversial Jewish thinker or I mean it seems to me he's he's kind of at the top of the list as who gets quoted and is seen as authority mm -hmm. on a lot of things. Um, it depends on which camp you belong to. So through much of the Jewish world uh, Maimonides is uh, yes, one of the greatest minds in, the, in, in Jewish history and respected for his philosophical writings as well as his commentaries, his Mishnah Torah, his code of Jewish law. Um, in the mystically inclined communities, um, Hasidic communities, uh, and some of the uh, Haredi non-Hasidic communities, they're much more ambivalent about Maimonides. Yes, again, you know, everybody respects the great eagle, that's Maimonides. But, you know, uh, some of them will say, well, you shouldn't read the, um, uh, guide for the perplexed without, you know, a lot of supervision, which they'll be reluctant to provide. Uh, the, the Hasidim will say, don't bother with it because it, it's, it's no help as far as anything important is concerned. Hmm? Is that his only writing that was seen as somewhat controversial? Well, that's the big one. Right. right. Um, now, the, the, the one that's a little bit controversial, although it was, <clears throat> um, it, it wasn't enough to, let's say, you know, kind of read him out of the pale, was his 13 principles of Jewish faith. Right? Because lots of people didn't agree with some of those principles. And in fact, it's been suggested that by the end of his life, Maimonides didn't agree with them either. You know, <laughs> funny how people right, change, right. right? Yeah. That happens to me um, all the time. Yeah, well, you know, from Monday to Thursday. But Maimonides did go through uh, something of a metamorphosis and Heschel talks about this in the biography he wrote of Maimonides, that in the years at the end of his life, when he had very little time for writing or teaching or anything else beyond what he was doing as the physician to the Sultan and his <clears throat> uh, palace, uh, that in that time, uh, Maimonides, uh, reevaluated a lot of what he had taught about uh, philosophy. That um, he, I guess you would say, he mellowed out a little bit, uh, and and that came from just taking care of people, taking care of the needy, taking care of the sick, right? Which you know he was doing all the time. You know, there, there's a very famous letter of Maimonides, uh, which you can easily find online. And uh, he talks about what his life was like as the physician to the Sultan and his, uh, you know, palace community. He basically had almost no time for himself. He ate, you know, one meal in the middle of the day while people were outside clamoring to see him and be evaluated, be healed and whatever. Um, it's just uh, a very uh, challenging existence for Maimonides. 
and yet it, it it may have humanized him a little bit. Um, yes, Daniel. Did he credit any contemporary scholars with any of his changing of his mind? Did he say so-and-so influenced me even? Not to my knowledge. Uh, but if he changed his mind, it probably wasn't because, you know, oh, he read somebody else's evaluation. Because many of the criticisms of Maimonides and the things that we're seeing here are written well after he died. Okay? The evaluation, the reevaluation that he went through was probably totally internal as a result of his experiences. Rabbi, do you recommend Heschel's book, his biography of Maimonides? Uh, yeah, absolutely. If you can get hold of it, it's, uh, it's great. Thank you. Um, like anything else by Heschel, you know, but, um, but yeah, if you're interested in, in what, and, and by the way, it was written very early in Heschel's career, but only translated into English, I think, uh, after Heschel died. So, but well worth reading. Uh, any other questions, comments before we go on? Okay, so let me, um, bring up the next text. And this is from um, Solomon Ibn Adret, the Rashba. Okay. And here is what he has to say. Right. Um, now, the um, not only the guide to the perplexed, but also the first part of the Mishnah Torah, which uh, was, uh, you know, contained a, a little bit of philosophical material. Those books had been banned by the rabbis of Northern France in the year 1232. You know what a ban means? It means that if you read it, you're excommunicated, right? If they find you reading it, well, you know, people lived pretty close together. So it was hard to um, get away with reading something that wasn't permitted. Okay. Um, and, um, and then there were rabbis uh, in Southern France and in Spain who were, uh, much more appreciative of Maimonides' philosophical work. Um, Rash Bahir is writing in the beginning of the 14th century. Uh, so, you know, there's a context where the bands in Northern France have existed for a long time. And for him, the problem is not as much what Maimonides says in his philosophy, but with philosophy in general. Um, you know, for the Rashba, Maimonides is, is too great to just you know, read him out. He says, you just shouldn't study philosophy, period, because the philosophy is you know, too much of a temptation and it lures people away from religious observance, um, which by the way, you know, the Kabbalists uh, were, um, you know, uh, also um, very strongly opposed to it for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, so Rashpa wants to limit the impact of philosophy and say, you know, the, if you're under 25, you're not mature enough to read this stuff and, and not be uh, uh, lured away from traditional observance. Um, so um, the, um, the rabbis in uh, Southern France and, uh, and in Spain, um, uh, they, um, they have their, their own view. And here's what the Rashba says. says. Woe to humanity 
because of the insult to the Torah, for they have strayed far from it. Its diadem have they taken away, its crown have they removed. Every person with censer in hand offers incense before the Greeks and the Arabs. And who are those people? They're the philosophers. Like Zimri. Remember Zimri? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Steve, for the illustration. Yeah. Zimri is the guy that Pinchas kind of uh, ran through after uh, Zimri engaged in, um, shall we say, you know, public cult sex, which is about as bad as it gets in the Torah. What I call the two for one special. Yes. It, there was a two for one Zimri and Cosby, the Midianite woman. They publicly consort with the Midianites and revel in their own filth. In other words, philosophy is compared to this horrible, treasonous act of cult sex. So the Arabs they do not the prefer the older Jewish teachings, but surrender to the newer, the prerogatives do their Jewish birthright. They turn not back, but act like strangers to their own teachings and like satyrs, like devils at the head of all the streets. They dance to these foreign ideas and even teach them to their children. They is mere. Therefore, when we saw the fowler snare even in the remote parts of the earth and the dove compelled to make her nest in the sides of the pit's mouth, we trembled and said the disease is spreading. So now we have risen and made a covenant with the Lord and the Torah of our God, which we and our ancestors have accepted on Sinai, not to let anything alien come among us, nor let the nettle and the thistle spring up in our palaces. Servants are we, servants of the Lord. The Lord he has made us, we are his. And therefore have we decreed and accepted for ourselves and our children, for all those joining us, that for the next 50 years under threat of the ban, no one in our community, unless they be 25 years old, shall study even either in the original language or in translation, the books which the Greeks have written on religious philosophy and the natural science. Okay? And just, you know, to rub this in here a little bit, nobody can teach any Jew under 25 any of these sciences, lest they drag them away from the law of Israel, which is superior to all these teachings. In other words, just, you know, stay away from this stuff um, totally, because it will just mess with your mind, and it will uh, draw you away from proper Judaism. Okay? You know, so, um, you know, the, the exception he makes is whatever Maimonides says about medicine, right? Because that's healing, that's okay, right? But we make this unofficial statement over the scroll of the Torah and in the presence of the whole community on Shabbat Devarim, right? That's it. That's, you know, so what do you think were the consequences of studying philosophy, at least from what the Rashba uh, believed here and those who agreed with him. What was, what was philosophy doing? Well, it, it's removing, removing a fence around the Torah. <laughs> Re removing a fence or in some cases, removing some of the things inside the fence. Yes, Steve? I think you look at it a little bit broader than just philosophy. You look at it as science, the challenge of other knowledge going on in the world, science. And you have two ways you can deal with it. Either you can try to ignore it, cut it out, which is what he's saying here. You know, ignorance, this bliss, whatever. Or you can try to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Have it coexist in some way. So they chose the route of trying to just ignore it entirely. Right. So... So one possibility is ignore it in the sense that you don't allow it to be taught, okay? 
the other approach they could have taken it taken it says you know well you know we'll study it and we'll take the uh the seeds of the pomegranate and throw away the rind right that's the talmudic metaphor that we saw before right but they could say well you know we're gonna we'll study it we'll say that certain parts of it are wrong or you know maybe certain parts are right and we'll we'll live with it that is not the route that the rashba took yes lou what authority did Rashba have? Was he the head of a large community or the head of a scholarly community? Or well, was he, he was probably the most respected scholar in his time in that area. So he had, you know, he probably did not do this on his own, but he is the author of this edict. And was he in Spain or Southern France? Um, I believe he was in Spain. Um, now, the Rashba also may have been a little bit influenced by the Kabbalistic community, but he's not one of the um, um, Kabbalists himself, I don't believe. Yes, Daniel. So this reference to Arabs, I don't know that much about what was going on with the Arabs. Reference the to what? Arabs. Yes, in the t it refers to Greeks and Arabs. Right, that's just, is, you know, because the Greek philosophy was being spread through Arab philosophers, and that spread to Spain, which for a long time was under Muslim control. And so uh, that's how it got to Maimonides in North Africa, and that's how it got to the Jews. Well, what, what I'm wondering, though, is how were the Arab philosophers who were simultaneously Muslim, I assume, treated by their, their more orthodox religious partners? For the most part, I think that they were accepted. Um, we, they were accepted, in terms but we of weren't accepted. philosophy, the Muslims in that era were uh, mostly very accepting of those trends. There were exceptions. There were Orthodox Muslims who did not cotton to that. And some of those groups were pretty vicious. I just find it very interesting that if the three groups, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, at the time, the group that was more open to philosophy, science, or rationalism, if you will, were the Muslims, not the Christians, for sure. Yeah, and well, apparently not. The you know, Jews. remember that Islamic civilization in that period was far more advanced in most respects than Christian civilization. The Jews are always in a minority status, and that makes it, you know, more difficult. And you know, you're sort of circling the wagons frequently. So you know, even in places where the Jews were open to outside ideas. When you're a minority group, uh, you tend to limit what those outside uh, ideas, uh, you know, what, which of those are gonna be allowed. I, I understand, but to me, it sounds a little bit like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, all these people are out to get us, so we're going to reject Right. Whatever so the right again, word. This rationally. was not universal among the Jews. Right. But it's, um, you know, it, it's definitely um, an issue. All right. Thank you. Sure. Uh, other comments or questions before we go on? All right. Let's go to the next text. And this is uh, from a contemporary Orthodox philosopher, Michael Wishagrad. Um, who um, wrote this uh, in the 1980s. Okay. And here's his comment. We cannot overlook a basic contradiction. The God of the Bible is a person. He is one of the characters who appears in the stories told in the Bible. He has a personality that undergoes development in the course of the story. 
He creates man with certain expectations, which are apparently disappointed, and he is then sorry that he has created him. He is subject to the emotions of anger and jealousy, among others. He is also filled with burning love, particularly toward Abraham and his descendants. He desires certain things and detests others, et cetera, all right? So the point is, there is a personality in the Bible who is God and who interacts with the other characters in the biblical narrative. Now let's take a, a second here. What, how does this relate to what Maimonides taught? Well, Maimonides was totally opposed to anything that smacked of anthropomorphism, of anything that tr treated God as having human qualities. To Maimonides, anything that was in the Bible that sounded like that, and he certainly acknowledged that that was true, had to be reinterpreted, had to be allegorized, had to be reread. Right? And so, against this simple fact, Jewish philosophy has marshaled all of its resources. The personality of God had to be demythologized. Okay. Um, God could not have those qualities, right? And if God could not foresee the consequences of his actions, as if, you know, that he was going to be disappointed when he created human beings, then he is not omniscient. A perfect God must be omniscient, all-knowing. The attribution of emotions to God was particularly unacceptable to Maimonides, who was firmly convinced that even properly rational men were ruled exclusively by reason rather than emotion, all right? Um, so um, let's, let's go a little further down. Um, it all had to be reinterpreted. Maybe common people could take the Bible literally, but it was not appropriate for intellectuals to think, you know, in terms of this simple picture of God. Right? Maimonides perfects this demythologization, this deliteralization of the Bible. And others did too. Philo did that long before. And gradually, the philosophic God comes to permeate Jewish consciousness. In other words, you know, by the time you and I were in Hader, right, we were taught the philosophic God. We were taught that God has no body, that God has no human characteristics. The God whom Adam feared and loved fades to be replaced by a philosophical principle, the real estrangement between God and man has begun. So, you know, although this is much more a reasoned treatment of Maimonides, there's definitely a critique of Maimonides, like what we saw before in Al Fakhar, uh, that um, you know there's there's a problem here that by using this philosophy we are distancing ourselves from God. Yes, Steve. I think they probably didn't. They ignored the parashah that we read yesterday. <laughs> Uh, yeah, contradicts this. I don't think it's. I think it was um, not substituting. It was the only way that, it, that man can describe God, so that we attribute certain feelings and emotions. It, it is in the Bible; it's written that way, but it doesn't necessarily meant to be taken it literally. It's, it's the only way that we can understand. Right. You know. Uh, but, but the, you know. The God tells Moses. God tells Moses. Um, you shall see my back, but you shall not see my face and live, which says that God has a face. You just, you're just not allowed to see it. 
you can see God's back. What? <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and by the way, in our study group Thursday night, we went through a number of texts in the tradition which, which talk about this notion of God having a body. Um, and my whole approach to that, and I've said this in my other class as well, is that, you know, what you and I learned that God has no body, that God is a spirit, okay? They didn't know that yet back then. Back in the day. And they didn't know it at all before Maimonides came along. Yes, other uh, comments or questions here? Yes, Lou. So if they, if the ancients didn't know that God was spirit and not physical or corporal, um, and yet uh, in the Ten Commandments, it tells us not to have graven images uh, because they may represent other gods. Is there a conflict there? Uh, not necessarily. Um, the idea that God has a physical being uh, is separate from the prohibition of making an image of that physical being. But you can imagine a physical being. And indeed they did. You know, I, I would argue that when people went to the temple, and I, I write about this in the book, you've probably seen it there. When people went to the temple generally speaking they went to have a direct experience of god's presence and in at least in many instances they felt that they saw god now i would i, I guess that most of us when we go to beth yashurn we don't go to see god we go to see lou dorfman <laughs> or steve finkelman or daniel bissonnet or, you know, whoever we hang out with, it, sure, right? But back in the time of the temple, you know, you went, be, you know, you expected to see God there because that's where God lived. Yes, Daniel. Okay, I, I, I don't fully understand. I don't know how to say his name, Michael. I don't understand his point. He starts off by saying the God of the Bible is a person. Okay. And, but then he seems to be saying it's not rational to give him emotions. I don't understand what is real. Can you summarize this guy's point for me in fewer words than he did? His point is God clearly has human characteristics in the Bible. Okay. Those characteristics make God more accessible to us. Now, as you can, you know, it, it's much easier, you know, imagine this. Um, you have a friend who is almost always totally dispassionate, who appears to have no human feelings, not necessarily somebody who would do something terrible, but not somebody who is moved to do something good either. They just, you know, go to work, come home. They have whatever they do. And that's it. But they don't appear to have any feelings. They don't appear to have any strong attachments to other people. Um, are you inclined? to hang around with this guy? Probably not. I mean, you know, you know, academically, maybe you're interested in this person, but you know, this person is not somebody you're likely to choose as a friend. What kind of God do you want? Do you want a God who is totally separated for you, totally dispassionate about you about the Jewish people, about everything under the sun? 
or do you want a God who cares? But, but is Michael saying that that is a good thing or a bad thing? Because it seems to me like he says two different things in two different places. It, well, he doesn't want to be disrespectful to Maimonides, I think. But he, he's definitely saying that that's, that's the God of the Bible. Therefore, that's a good thing. Okay, so when he says in that very last sentence, um, the real estrangement between God and man has begun, he's not talking about now. He's talking about what Maimonides did. Yes. yes. Okay, that's, that's where I was missing. I thought he was yes. talking about what's happening right now. Yes. Okay. And, and, and by the way, the, those who are of uh, the more mystical camp, they are definitely going to say what Wishagrad says here, right? Because they want that <laughs> God who is accessible to them, that they want to feel close to, right? That's a high priority for them. Jerry, did I see that you had a hand up before? Please unmute and tell us your comment or question. All right. Going, going back to Maimonides' uh, 13 Principles of Faith, we have Yigdal and the Siddur. Everybody accepts that, correct? No, not correct. No? <laughs> nope. <laughs> How yeah, about Yigdal, <laughs> Yigdal is in, yes, Yigdal is based on the 13 Principles of Maimonides. Right. There are many lovely tunes to it, and so people no, are no, no, very attached to it. But, you know, go through it yourself and decide if those 13 principles are all things that you believe in personally. Now, mm -hmm. you do, so that's fine. And that, that's, and, you know, perfectly okay with me. <laughs> Far be it for me to read out somebody who agrees with what Maimonides taught at one time in his life. But there are those who argue that Maimonides didn't believe those things by the end of his life. But it's fine. Okay. Uh, but, but even immediately after Maimonides wrote about 13 articles of faith, there were Jews who said, what? <laughs> you, don't, you don't really believe that I mean, you, you have to believe that. And by the way, Maimonides was so strong on the idea of faith in these principles. He said, if a Jew doesn't believe in these principles, that that person has forfeited their place in the world to come. How strong is that? Pretty strong. Pretty strong. Right? Okay. So, yeah. Also, in the back of the art scroll after the chakra service, uh, the 13th principle of faith is read every day. Yeah, there, there are lots of Orthodox Jews who read the Yigdal, or not the Yigdal, but the, the 13 principles of Maimonides on which the Yigdal was based. And they, yeah, unlike many of us who, you know, we finished the Friday night traditional service with Yigdal, okay? And, um, nice little tunes and uh it's, you know nobody's hurt by singing igdal and you know we get to go out singing right yeah except that most of us do not believe in all 13 of those okay uh, other comments or questions here okay um so I, you know, I hope that out of this, you, you, you get a, a sense of why this kind of talk about God um, troubled uh, some of the philosophers. Um, and one of the things that I want to ask you to consider as a part of this is, you know, what you do and what you think about how you believe in God. You know, is the God that you believe in uh, the God of Maimonides 
or maybe something a little more personal, right? Yeah, and you know, do you do things because they are traditional and familiar, like the way we sing Yigdal on Friday night? You know, how it makes you feel, um, or are you maybe a little more questioning about some of those things? Um, and then, um, you know, there was this debate among rabbinic authorities about what was appropriate to teach as Jewish. And we can have the, um, the, the same kind of debate today. What exactly do we teach in our um, religious program for young people? What do we, you know, what do we teach our high school students, let alone our, our younger kids, right? Um, and, um, and maybe some of that is more than most of us are will, willing to deal with. But maybe we should deal with it more often, right? So, um, and then, you know, the, the last thing I, I would toss out here is what do we give up if we accept the Maimonidean model of a, a, a God that is totally unknowable and not personal, right? Um, how does that work for us? if we give up on this idea of a, a God that has certain, at least human-like qualities. Okay. So that's one of the tensions that has been present in God talk among Jews for many, many centuries, and presumably will continue, okay? Um, other comments or questions before we uh, before we go forward? Yes, Lou. Uh, was Maimonides the first or early in the philosophers who professed that God did not have anthropomorphic uh, qualities? He's the primary one. Um, you have hints of this in Sadia Gaon, you know, a couple of centuries before, but uh, Maimonides is the first person to, to really come down hard on this issue and to reject any kind of anthropomorphic qualities in God. What, what do the Talmudic scholars, uh, uh, the who wrote the Talmud, what do they say? <laughs> they are all over the map. I, I, I think that's, a, that's the, the best way I can put it. But, but rarely do any, I mean, they're aware of the issues, but there are some who are more careful about how they talk about God as, you know, with human qualities. And there are those who have, no hesitation at all about that. They're all over the map. Okay. All right. Uh, Rabbi, can I ask you a question? Yes, please, Karen. Um, which of the 10, 13 principles would you say, I mean, just glancing at it and looking at Yigdal, it doesn't seem like, it seems like most of it is pretty much what are the general principles of Judaism. I mean, the one thing, the last one, I guess, is that he restore, brings back the dead to life. Um, um, okay, so that, that would be one that would be um, kind of interesting for a lot of people. But other than that, what which other ones are you? Well, the idea of Torah given from heaven. Okay, right? all right. Uh, so that one would be controversial in our time, certainly. Right. Even though I think, you know, most Jews would have agreed with that, you know, certainly in his time. Right. It just, just those two, pretty much. 
Um, well, I, I don't want to go, you know, point by point. Yeah, okay. Um, just, you know, suffice it to say that even in his time, there was difference at, of opinion, at least about a few of, of his principles. All right, thank you. And, and, and certainly the idea that um, if you didn't believe in all those things, you were deprived of a spot in the world to come. Uh, other people said, well, you know, <laughs> greater people than you, Maimonides, have uh, uh, said differently. Okay, um, so our next unit deals with the question of religion of the heart and religion of the mind. And, and this, of course, is a little bit similar to the issue around the controversy around uh, the teachings of Maimonides. Um, you know, is Judaism first and foremost uh, spiritual uh, or is it intellectual? I mean, everybody would agree that to some degree it is ethical, right? Some people might put that at the center of Jewish life. But, mo you know, there's a continuum among Jews as to how much of you know, their Judaism is primarily spiritual and how much of it is primarily intellectual. Uh, and that plays out, um, and, 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 you know, and the other thing relating to that is who gets to decide, right? Um, so uh, you know, do we have a, a free marketplace of ideas or is there some group at the top or some individual at the top who says this is in and that is out. Okay. So uh, this came out very strongly in the um, dispute in the 18th century, the late 18th century between Hasidism, Hasid in pious, right? the Hasidim and the Mitnagdim. Mitnagade means to be opposed. So they were the, you know, the camp of Judaism as it had existed for some time before. Uh, and they, uh, they were opposed to the trend in Hasidism. So we're going to read, we're going to see a video introducing us to this teaching. Um, so Jennifer, why don't you roll it? We'll watch it to the end, even if it takes us uh, beyond uh, our time. The rise of Hasidism in the second half of the 18th century sparked unprecedented fury and controversy in East European Jewry. Beginning in 1772, leaders of several major Jewish communities issued writs of excommunication prohibiting their members from interacting with followers of the new Hasidic sect, from speaking to them, giving them communal offices or honors, marrying them, or doing business with them. Hasidic prayer groups were forcibly disbanded and their leaders were arrested and publicly disgraced and humiliated by Jewish communal officials. The bands cast the Hasidim as heretics and urged community members to root out the threat. This led to officially sanctioned grassroots violence, at times escalating to the point of murder. The conflict between Hasidism and its opponents was the first denominational crisis in Judaism in over 800 years. Hasidism was founded by Rabbi Israel Ben Eliezer, better known as the Baal Shem Tov, who led a circle of followers in the town of Miezbyz, Ukraine, then southeastern Poland. His ideas and practices spread like wildfire after his death. 
the key features of Hasidism were popularization of the mystical ideal of communion with God, Dvekut, embrace of joyful worship through song and dance, and devotion to a new type of religious leader, the mystic miracle worker known in Yiddish as Rebbe. Hasidism was imbued with a spirit of innovation, especially in the area of prayer. Its style of prayer was ecstatic, with shouts and shaking of the body, and it replaced the centuries-old Ashkenazic liturgy with the liturgy of the Kabbalists of Tzfat. These changes were so significant that the Hasidim founded their own houses of prayer. In Jewish communities across Eastern Europe, both rabbis and lay leaders were scandalized by the new movement. Rabbis, led by the Vilna Gaon, Rabbi Elijah ben Salman Zalman, objected to Hasidism's neglect and, in some instances, denigration of Talmud study. For them, the study of the Talmud and Jewish law was the most profound way to commune with God. They also believed that proper observance of the mitzvot was impossible without in-depth study of the laws. Lay leaders were infuriated by Hasidism's organizational independence and separatist tendencies. With its own houses of prayer, its own religious leaders, Hasidism weakened the Kahal, the state-recognized Jewish community board, and the communal institutions under its auspices. For example, when Hasidim established their own form of shechita, ritual slaughter, this caused a major loss of income to the Kahal, which had held a monopoly on the slaughter and sale of kosher meat. Finally, many were shocked by Hasidism's spirit of innovation and experimentation. Practices such as wearing all white from head to toe on Shabbat, talking to God in Yiddish, and taking solitary meditational walks in the forest these were jarring to the carriers of a very conservative religious culture who put a premium on doing things, quote, the way our ancestors did. Even more disturbing were the few Hasidic practices that actually violated halakha, especially the custom of delaying the recitation of prayers until one had more kavanah, intention and feeling, in disregard of the mandated times for prayer. The conflict between Hasidim and Mitnagdim opponents escalated over time to extreme degrees. Both sides resorted to denouncing the other to the Gentile authorities in violation of an ancient taboo against Mesira, informing on a fellow Jew. Hasidim denounced the Kahal of Vilna for embezzlement of funds and succeeded in having its leaders deposed by the Russian authorities. Mitnagdim informed on Rabbi Schneir Zalman of Lyadi, the founder of Chabad Hasidism, hurling bogus charges of support for an enemy state, the Ottoman Empire, and corrupting Jewish youth with a new degenerate religion. Schneir Zalman was arrested and imprisoned twice by the Russians. Why was Hasidism so intensely threatening to the Mitnagdim? Looking at the historical context of the conflict can shed some light on this question. The second half of the 18th century was a time of great insecurity and anxiety for the Jewish community. In the 1750s, a bizarre messianic movement led by Jacob Frank plagued the Jews of Ukraine and southern Poland. Frankism preached the intentional violation of the Torah's laws, including the prohibitions against eating pork and even incest. It allied itself with the Catholic Church for protection, publicly attacked the Talmud, and even accused Jews of engaging in the ritual murder of Christian children. Their charges led to a public burning of the Talmud by Jesuits and fueled a wave of blood libels in Poland. 
with Frankism fresh in their minds, Mignagdim viewed Hasidism as yet another dangerous new sect that could wreak havoc on the Jewish community. A second blow to the Polish Jewry was the abolition of the main nationwide Jewish institution, the Council of Four Lands, by the Polish authorities. The Council constituted a kind of Jewish parliament and high rabbinic court whose decrees were binding on all Jewish communities. Without a central authority, communities became atomized and had no formal structure for collaboration and coordination. Social control was weakened. Mitnagdim saw Hasidism as a source of lawlessness and chaos that would further erode the Jewish community. Their anxiety over collapse was only heightened by the fact that the Polish kingdom itself was falling apart, culminating in the seizure of most of Poland by the Russian Empire. One final point of historical context. It's important to bear in mind that in the late 18th century, ideas of religious pluralism and tolerance had not yet reached East European Jewry. Modern Jewish denominations didn't arise until the mid-19th century, and they arose in Germany, not in Poland or Russia. Mitnagdim saw it as their sacred duty to protect and defend the one and only true Judaism and to prevent defections to an unauthorized sect. Ultimately, the battle to suppress Hasidism was a monumental failure. The movement spread successfully throughout Eastern Europe, where large numbers of Jews were drawn to Hasidism for its spirituality, liveliness, and mystical leadership. Only in Lithuania, where the authority of the Vilna Gaon was supreme, did the Mitnagdim prevail. The conflict was ultimately laid to rest by the Russian government, which decreed in 1804 that both forms of Judaism were legitimate in the eyes of the state. But even after the violent struggle was over, fundamental religious differences between Hasidim and Mitnagdim persisted. The Mitnagdim went on to build major Lithuanian yeshivas for study of the Talmud, while Hasidic life was concentrated in the Rebbe's courts, where thousands of believers flocked to pray and connect with their revered leaders. What is the legacy of this historical episode for us? The clash between Hasidim and Mitnagdim highlighted core internal tensions within Judaism, between spirituality, intellectualism, and activism. To what extent is Judaism about experiencing God or knowing the Torah or properly performing the mitzvot? How does one balance between these competing aspects and when should one aspect give way to the other? 200 years later, contemporary Jewish communities wrestle with these very same questions in determining their policies and priorities. For example, should congregations use instrumental music for the sake of kavanah or abstain from musical instruments in accordance with tradition and halakha? Should they hire a rabbi who is first and foremost a teacher and imparter of tradition or a pastoral and inspirational figure? Should synagogue resources be spent on classes and lectures or on creative prayer services and meditation groups? All of these questions are echoes of the great debate between Hasidim and Mitnagdim. This chapter in Jewish history also raises issues about the limits of pluralism and tolerance in the Jewish community. While we no longer live in an era of excommunications, most mainstream Jewish institutions would not give a forum to representatives of Jews for Jesus or organizations that call for the boycott of Israel or the elimination of the state of Israel. Remembering the conflagration in East European Jewish life more than 200 years ago leads us to reflect more deeply on when we should say no 
and how we should say no to forms of Judaism with which we strenuously disagree. Okay, um, I apologize for keeping you a little bit late. Um, if you have comments or questions about this, hold on to them. I'll, I'll do a, a brief um, uh, comment at the beginning next time, and then we'll talk, and then we'll head into the texts in Unit 8. Thank you all very much. Those of you who are coming back for our second class, uh, we'll be there in about three, four minutes. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank Excellent. You. Thank you.